Did you get your uh, thumb drive? Hi, everybody. So who was here for the first meeting? Raise your hand. Who wasn't here for the first meeting and joined us fresh? Just a few people. Who won't raise your hand no matter what question I ask you? <laughs> One the back there should raise your hand to prove me wrong. All right, well, we're just going to pick up where we left off then. Before I'm done here, the next 35, 40 minutes, I'm going to show you some data that looks at a snapshot of the people who are in prison uh, from uh, the Fushis and Terrebonne parishes. And I'm going to pick up where we left off because I want to get into more of a detail. So what we uh, talked about a little while ago, just in summary, was what's this initiative look like? How are we looking at risk and need assessment? Dividing up different people different ways, making sure we know who's low risk, moderate risk, high risk. Know we're going to reduce recidivism. We've got to work with the people that are most likely to fail. We've got to target people. We're going to uh, use our community resources and assets wisely. We've got to target the people that are most likely going to fail. If we just work with the people on the lower end, we won't change the recidivism rate. We've got a state structure to support the work, and we have a local structure. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about that local structure. So I already mentioned in the last session, it's just a few people were here. This is what a local steering team looks like, where we have 60, 70, 80 people. About this time, again, you know, double the number of people at the first meeting and this meeting. They look like a coalition who support the effort. Their job is to be educated and educate others. But you can't get decisions made and get a lot of work done with a, you know, 60, 80, 100 people in the room. You've got to have a smaller group of people to help steer that ship. And that's why we call it the steering team. And in this group, then, we've got representatives who are uh, subject matter experts on the things that matter about doing the work. Housing, employment, behavioral health. We've got legal, uh, represented, family, and children. And we have uh, three co-chairs. We have a community co-chair that's presiding, who is a civic leader and also a parole co-chair. Uh, Corey's here from Parole Corey. I think everybody, he's dressed in red today, which is very <laughs> special for us. Uh, doesn't mean he's from Ohio State, though, by the way. We, we, we not look in that direction. But Corey's been at the table with us. It's been four or four and a half years that he's been part of the second, so we're thrilled to be able to bring it to, to his district. But he or one person from his staff will represent then uh, one of those co-chairs, and then I we'll have a jail representative, and the community co-chair will be presiding. And that's important because the re-entry initiative, the coalition and the steering team, is owned by the community. These are our returning citizens. They're not the responsibility solely of the Department of Correction, who only has them for a limited period of time. They were here before they went. They're going to be here when they come back. And we've got to own it. And so this group does not work for the Department of Corrections. You work on behalf of the community, and that community co-chair uh, is that uh, representative. This focus on this risk-need assessment, I mentioned that. I'm going to go into a lot of depth. Let me slide through this deep stuff here. I want to talk a little bit about what the responsibilities are here. And in this group of uh, slides that I'm uh, going to talk you through, I'm talking about two different uh, entities at once. I'm talking about the steering team itself, which again is that larger group of people. I should have done this a minute ago. But I'm also, does this have a uh, pointer in it? Yes, the green, the, over the uh, arrow keys. Oh, look at that. See that right there? That community coordinator I mentioned earlier, in order for this to work effectively, in order for these three leaders to be effective, they've got to have some level of staffing. And when I talk then about the responsibilities of the steering team, I don't separate it from that community coordinator because you've got to have some staff support. We've been pretty successful at raising some local and some <coughs> philanthropic dollars to be able to put at least a part-time contractual person on. 
because you've got to have somebody to call the meetings and do a lot of the work and keep track of the records that need to take place. So I talk about both of them in these slides that dig into these responsibilities. So the first focus area has to do with coordination and communication. And when I threw those slides up earlier about what the framework looks like, and I showed you the three phases, getting ready, going home, staying home, how they are in the prisons or in the parish jails for years or more in the first phase, then they move to a local facility in the second phase, and then they're released. And all those different things that we have to attend to, those are part of the framework. There is a workbook that we use to make certain that folks are very clear about the details. In your packets, you have a summary of that. And that summary looks at the focus areas of the top priorities for services, housing, education, employment, behavioral health, being mental health, and substance abuse. There's a workbook behind that that this summarizes. Members of the steering team are expected to go deeper into the weeds on the work and understand how this workbook works. And what this does is this workbook guides this activity, introduces the steering team members and their committees to all the research that we have that built this model, and gives them a set of activities to participate in that helps them do two things with these major priorities. One, make certain that we're clear about the assets we have, the resources we have, and how they can be applied for this target population of returning citizens. And two, perhaps even more importantly, how those systems can be improved and how gaps that we assess for resources can be filled with additional resources. At the end of the day, the steering team's job is to understand what is in this community and what's missing. And of what's here, how much of it do we have? How many slots? What are the resources? What are the restrictions? And to understand that so we can apply that again to this target population and hook these services up with people before they get out because we're going to be identifying the ones that are most likely to fail. That is the moderate uh, uh, risk group. And so understanding the way this framework uh, operates, understanding the detail of it, and coordinating that and communicating that is the first focus area of the steering team. That last bullet there talks about effective policies and practices. So imagine that this is year four of the development of this effort. In the first two years, as I mentioned earlier, we had a group of 35 folks from the Department of Corrections, all facets of the Department of Corrections, met every quarter with work in between for two full years. Corey is one of the key members of that group. As a result of doing two years of education and training, they adopted this model, and they agreed to develop a policy that takes this framework and makes it a rule and regulation in the Department of Corrections. It embeds in policy in the Department of Corrections the evidence-based practices that I talked about in the first meeting. It says the Department of Corrections shall follow these. And then the expectation is they support that, ex that, that uh, directive with the training that the folks need to be able to do the work. I had a question uh, from uh, Assistant District Attorney during the break about uh, so, you know, we're supervising the folks, and, and, and what's different? They're already overworked, and a couple of people asked me this question. And you know, parole is overworked, there's no doubt about it. I, I, who in this room doesn't feel like they're overworked? Raise your hand. Look at that. See? Parole is overworked. But what we've seen is that they're always willing to take a look at the resources they have and think differently about them. In Orleans Parish, Corey's counterpart, he's picked two parole officers who are going to concentrate on these cases. 
They're not doing any more work or any less work. It just reorganized so that when we're working with the first 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, they're not spread across to all of the folks that are supervising former prisoners. Become specialized. That's the key to the system. That's the key to the framework. That's what this is about. That's what these evidence-based practices mean. Don't treat all returning prisoners the same way. Treat them according to their risk level and according to their needs and put your resources on the high end. That's what's in this policy. Whoop. That's it. This refers to, as the steering team will, will learn, something called the case logic model. How is this supposed to work from the beginning of the point of imprisonment all the way through the end of discharge? Who's supposed to do what when? What responsibility do we have in the prisons, in the parish jail, in the parole system for people to do work differently? That's what the, is in this policy and procedure. How are we going to do our work on the ground, the casework, differently? Gentleman here asked a question about the focus on employment. Lady in the back asked about a focus on housing. Very critical issues. Two things we're going to do. Make sure we understand what we have, how we can apply what we have to the special population, but also, importantly, how do we improve those systems? Over time, this is long-term work. The expectation in this policy is the people in the Department of Corrections are stepping up and they're going to be doing things differently. I think Corey knows that there's been some announcement that the Department of Corrections is adding some specialized staff to the parole field. They're called uh, program managers, community resource developers. A large part of their job is to bring this to life. They've already hired Five, we think? Yeah. They've hired five. Have they committed to you on your time frame? No, they haven't mentioned it. Well, I, we push, we're, we're pushing hard to say the first five, that's good. We're already in the next seven. And of the next seven, we've got several that are in the lead. Y'all are one of those now as a result of doing this work. Y'all, Wash, uh, Washita and uh, Calcasieu are pretty much further ahead they should be able to get this additional resource and when some funding becomes available soon we're pushing for some of that funding to come this way. Why? We've got to hire a community coordinator. I lost my pointer. What did I do? Sorry y'all. Um, but this whole idea of policy and procedure, that's what drives organizations. How many folks here work for a nonprofit or government or an agency? How many of you have policies and procedures? What happens if you don't follow them? You're in trouble. You've got to get trained to be able to understand them and follow them, right? Policy dictates everything in the Department of Correction. You live and you die by it. But you can't do it in a vacuum. You've got to have proper training and involvement. That. That's what. That's why we have that up here as a primary focus. Make sense? That's what the steering team. We're going to ask people later before we're done if you want to sign up to be a member of a search committee that selects the steering team. Now you may want to be on the steering team, so you should sign up. But we're not asking people today to sign up for the steering team. We're asking you to help us figure out who it should be. And the reason we do that, when you ask people to join, sometimes you get three people in employment, four people doing housing, and it ends up being the wrong select group. You've got to be very mindful about it. It's got to be a recruitment and screening and appointment process. And we learned that by not doing it that way in jurisdictions where we ended up with a volunteer group, and it was like herding cats. We could never get them to get the stuff done. That's part one. So we're going to come back to that. So this is the first task. Make sure that we're clear in the steering team, through those co-chairs, through that community coordinator, what is the Department of Correction and the Center for Justice Innovation, that would be uh, me, and then joining us, the Louisiana 
Prisoner Reentry Steering Team Association that Bonnie's uh, helping uh, bring to light. Make sure we're clear about what's expected and what resources we have. There is a memorandum of understanding that once a community agrees to form up a coalition and form up a steering team, that that steering team leadership signs. It's a non-binding, non-legal memorandum of understanding that says, uh, we understand what Department of Corrections and CJI is going to do and hold our feet to the fire, and then we understand what we have to do and what that is about is the things that I'm talking about here. And the reason we want you to sign this non-legal, non-binding agreement is because we're going to be working with real live cases, and we don't want anybody to be working with real live people without having some real clear understanding about what's supposed to happen. And so it's, it's something that we've had no controversy in doing, but it's another example of the steering team being responsible for understanding what the responsibilities are to bring this thing to life. The second focus area is to make sure that there's a process in place to do a formal assessment of your community assets, the barriers to getting those assets applied for the special population, and then the gaps in the services. Gaps is about money, Barriers is not about money. Barriers could be policy restrictions. Barriers could be lack of communication. Barriers could be we don't know what the community is doing on the west side compared to the east side. A community this size is probably likely not the case, but in other places it is. And if we start by talking about gaps, which is about money, if we start there, we become depressed and demoralized and we go home, we don't do the work. So we've got to talk about our assets first. And we have a document that's called, shockingly, a community assessment instrument that is just a guide on how you look at what you have and what type of information we need. Communities often know a great deal about what they have, but they don't know all of it. And if you're a larger nonprofit or a state agency, they're clear about it. But if you're a smaller agency or a nonprofit or a faith-based group, they may not know it at all. And if they know you're there, then I may not be all that clear about what you do, how you do it, and how many you can do it with, and how many you can do it for. And believe me, to do this work, you've got to have everybody at the table. It's the harder. So this community assessment is a kind of a clerical administrative job. It's calling people, it's getting information, it's filling it out, it's making sure that it's published and it's updated. Steering team can help make that happen. That's why you've got to have a community coordinator. Some of the jurisdictions, we've had some folks step up to the plate, nonprofits say, you know, I've got an intern. The intern uh, can help do this. You know, there's different ways to get this done. But that's that second focus there. What are the assets? This document also then, looks at the barriers. Let's say that a program says, look, we'll take people, we'll take anybody who's ever had a violent conviction. No domestic violence. We'll take anybody who's ever had a conviction of arson. We won't take anybody who's ever had a conviction for any type of sex offense. We won't do this. We won't do that. We won't do this. These are barriers. What we have to know in order to understand the depth of barrier or the height of the barrier is understand who's getting out of prison, who are moderate to high risk, and how much of those characteristics of this group are restricted away from these programs. And try to convince some of the programs, if we can, to lift some of those restrictions. Because if programs in the community have so many restrictions that they're only working with our low risk group over here, you joined and you sat in the right spot. Don't sit next to this guy here. He's in the wrong group. Low risk group, you can watch him. Low risk group, moderate group, high risk group over here. If the nonprofits and the groups in the community have all these restrictions, so they're working with this group, they're not going to help us reduce recidivism much because these folks aren't going back. Now that's okay. If their job and their mission is to help people 
Great, this is social work agents. There's nothing wrong with it. But if they say, and their mission is to reduce recidivism, they're going to do that by working with the low risk group. So that's what you do when you do this assessment. And you look at these barriers. And importantly, then, you look at the gaps. Housing, always a big gap. Employment, always a big gap. Nothing could be more difficult than housing. It's a long-term effort to develop additional housing. But if you don't start now to fill those gaps five years from now, you're still going to be wringing your hands and saying, guess what, we still don't have enough housing. You got to go to the local housing authority. We got to get support from the state housing authority. We got to get federal support. You do that by being organized and formalized. You do that by having a steering team and co chairs, by having documentation that you can use to develop these grant opportunities. You don't get federal money unless you can document what you're doing. All that documentation is what we bring to the table here so we can focus on the work at hand. So that is the second part of this, identification of the assets, the barriers and the gaps. Along with that, the formation of committees under the steering team. How many folks here have got a special area of housing? Raise your hand. Not any? Lady back there, you got to raise your hand. There you go. So housing. So we got to have a couple of people sitting on a committee. That's their focus is housing. How about education? Raise your hand. A couple of people. How about behavioral health, mental health, substance abuse, more folks. Employment, family unification, social work, transportation. The main points of reference here statewide are employment, housing, education, and behavioral health. Every parish forms those committees under their steering team. The person who is the convener of that committee sits on the steering team and draws committee members from outside the steering team so you bring more people to the table. So you have a subject matter expert on housing, one on employment, one on behavioral health, probably two on behavioral health, mental health and substance abuse. They each join the steering team because they agree to head up these committees. That's why you have to recruit and you have to screen. And then they say, hey, I know three or four people I want to bring to the table. They got a passion here. We'll do the work. Those are the committees. That's the job of the steering team. Keeping those groups organized is the job of the community coordinator. The job that I have and the job that the Department of Correction has is to make sure that they've got the training and the documentation they need to be able to do improvements on those systems, and that's what's in this workbook. And so it's very organized. The Louisiana La Prista, Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Steering Team Association, Lonnie Hawkins, I introduced her earlier again here, they're going to be helping with this. They're getting some funding from the Wilson uh, Foundation to be able to Join forces. We will have, by the end of 2018, probably 10 parishes that are up and running and organized. When you join forces, then we can have regional trainings and we can bring the committees here with the committees in other jurisdictions. The state has the same exact committees. So we end up all getting in the same boat and all rowing in the same direction and understanding that we got to focus like a laser beam on improving these resources over time and dig in and get it done. We won't be judged by what we get done in the first three months or six months. It'll be better after year one, better yet after year two, better yet after year three, better yet after year five, better yet after year ten because this is a permanent structure, it's a permanent infrastructural development effort, it will never stop. It took a long time to get into this situation. It'll take a long time to get out. And you can look around the room and look around the human service agencies and in parole and in the prisons and recognize the people that are working in there that are in their 30s and their 40s. They're going to be around a while. They're like, like an old dog like me. ain't going to be around all that much longer. Not like I'm going to die or anything, but I'm pushing 66. I can't do it forever. Look at this guy. he got a full head of dark hair. <laughs> I remember what dark hair used to look like. <laughs> He's going to be around a while. 
right? And so we take this long-term effort. That's what we're looking for when we form up these committees. People that are dedicated to work are going to be around for a while because it's taken a long time. That's the second uh, task. Focus area three, and this is coming upon us pretty quickly. So you imagine that we have then a deeper appreciation, understanding. There's been some training on the workbook. People have got the committees formed up, right? We understand in the housing and in the employment and the education, what are the assets we have, what are the barriers we have. You've got the research, you're doing some committee work, right? We've got to pull it all together and we've got to start taking a look. Well, how many people are getting out of prison who are coming back to this community and of the ones getting out who are low, moderate, high risk and of the moderate to high risk that we're targeting, which ones have the greater needs? That's our target. What would we do if we had $100,000 more money coming into this community to work with that? It doesn't start with the money. It starts with the assets and the barriers, and then we address the gaps. So it isn't all about the money, but at the end of the day, it's about the money. Because you've got to have resources to be able to do the work. How do you get the resources? You deliberately go after an examination of the assets, the barriers, and the gaps. Somebody says, how much housing do you need? We say, we need a lot more. How much money does it take? A lot more. That ain't going to get you a penny. What we need to know is specificity. We've got, on average, 15 people getting out every two months that don't have any housing. And if we don't give them the housing that they need, the likelihood that they recidivate and return to prison is twice as high as those that have the housing. That costs the taxpayers of this parish in the state X amount of money. And that cost is half of what we want you to invest in. When you can fill in those gaps with real information, that's how you raise dollars. It isn't about the money, it's about the planning. You get a good plan, it'll get funded. That's what a comprehensive community plan does. This two parish community looks at the number of people that are getting out, looks at those assets, barriers, and gaps, puts that down into a comprehensive plan and says, look, this is what we have, and this is what we need. This is how we're going to do the work following this model. And we put that into a comprehensive plan and a funding application, and we put it in front of the state, and we put it in front of the feds, and we put it in front of philanthropies, and we're going to get some more money. Because it's disciplined, and it's organized, and that's a big part of the work. Make sense? How many folks here are in the business of raising funds for your organizations? Makes a lot of sense, y'all, in that. Got to make sure that this plan is complete. La Prista, Vani, and I've been working now for the past couple of weeks. I'm putting together a comprehensive planning document to put it in front of the Secretary of the Department of Corrections, which we did last night. And his first response was, I'll take a look. I'm eager to see more of it. It's only 50 pages long. It'll take a little while to look at it. But it is comprehensive. And we're putting this documentation into the mix. So it isn't just us talking about it. It's us specifying how will that take place. The state is about to announce that there's dollars available to do this type of work. The feds announce it all the time. Millions of dollars of federal money. We hardly have any communities in the state going after that money. And one of the reasons we don't is that they're not organized. They don't have the documentation. They don't have a framework. They don't have a plan. They don't have a structure. That's what we bring to the table. It makes sense? It must be a big task here because the print's getting smaller. Whoops. Went too far. So, earlier on, if you are here earlier, uh, I mentioned, I'll repeat here, that the glue that holds all this stuff together is the individualized case plan. 
No matter what, all the structures, all the committees, all that stuff, it's all focused on one thing. This group of moderate to high-risk people, each of them has to have an individualized plan. The sheriff talked about it in his presentation. His plan is different from her plan, different from hers, different from hers, different from his. But they all are going to be attacking the same types of things. How you doing with employment? How you doing with housing? What you doing with that substance abuse problem? You got co-occurring disorder. Individualized plans. In order for that plan to take place, we have to know who the people are who are being housed in the local jail. They're going to be moved here at least three months earlier, or three months in advance of being released. That means they're going to be right here. We don't have to. They're spread out right now. You've got people from this parish, from these two parishes, scattered in 63 different parish facilities. You can't run an airline that way. You got, you know, being released from 60 different places. You've got to get it organized. That's the discipline that we bring. So once we've got them organized and we've got the assets and the barriers identified, we're trying to fill in the gaps, we do the individualized planning. That is more the responsibility of the community coordinator, but the steering team has got the right people at the table. Whoops, forgot the chart got the right people at the table to help with that work because you've got the subject matter experts in housing, employment, and behavioral health. You've done the acid barrier gap analysis. It gets down to these individualized plans. we got to work closely with the Department of Corrections to identify, starting with the men who are coming back, make sure they're placed. we got to make sure we're working with Corey and his team, that they've got the specialized agents or the set-aside agents to be able to work with them. We've got a re-entry accountability planning document that needs to be completed. We've got their assessments of their risk and need. It goes in a file. This isn't rocket science. It sounds like what we're, what we're doing is what any agency would do, right? Working with people. It's kind of based on the medical model. How many people here have been in the hospital? When you get out of the hospital, what do they do? Open the door and let you out? They do a little bit of work with you first, right? Wheel you to the door, you got your medication, you got your list of stuff. That's re-entry planning. This isn't any different than that. It's built on that medical model. Again, folks from behavioral health, raise your hand. This is what y'all do, right? Is anything unique? You're going to let people out of mental health facilities or hospitals or substance abuse facilities, you got to have a good plan. What you support that one? Where are you going back to? I'm going to go back and live with my grandmother. How long are you going to live with your grandmother? Well, I can live there as long as I want. Hey, Granny, how long can you live there? I don't mean to look at you and call you Granny. We're going to live. You know what they're going to say? As long as you're not going to do the right thing. That's right. Granny says two weeks tops, and he's out of here. <laughs> two weeks tops, and you got the guy sitting in jail. So I'll stay there as long as I want. Oh, no. Any rules? No, you know, she just kind of let me be. Oh, yeah, there's rules. No drinking, no drugs, etc. I tell you, these grandmothers, they're hell on wheels. They are hell on wheels. But that's what this planning has to look like, and it's got to get down to the case level. And because we're not going to be working with everybody who gets out. Let's say that, that if we do this comprehensive plan, and we're going to target, in the first round of funding, $100,000. We ain't going to work with it. 50 people a month for $100,000. I'm going to show you what the numbers look like in a minute. But you start with the number of people that you can work with, and you prove the concept. If this is all of our moderate high risk, and we got, you know, this is what gets out in a month, right? This group here is some 20, 25 folks here. That's probably a little high for, for what we get in a month here for moderate high risk, I think. Um, I'm going to work with 20, 25. Those folks here on the moderate side that are lower need, we're going to give them less, but this is our group right here we want to work with. Moderate risk, moderate to high need, and we're going to work with 10 of them, 20 of them, 30 of them, whatever we can work with over time. We're not going to be dictated by the state how many people we'll work with because we don't, we own this. This community owns this. You want us to do more work? Give us more money. But we'll do what we can with what we have. But for every dollar you give us, we already got two dollars we're spending on it. So you're investing. You're helping us with this investment. And that's what this case planning 
uh, ends up uh, uh, looking. Okay? Any questions on that? Yeah, look, when you, when you talk about the money for, for housing, I'm kind of confused about that. Uh, you, what, what, what do you mean? You, you pay rent for them until they get a job? You, what, what, how do you use the you, money? Well, you'll, you'll figure that out, but yeah, subsidizing uh, housing is a typical thing that uh, has to be done when there's no housing. And you can, you can determine halfway houses. You can determine all sorts of things. It all depends what the community has and what they need and what your numbers look like. But the idea is that you take a look at the assets you have, the barriers and the gaps, and you fill in the gaps. It's not dictated by anybody but y'all. Make sense? Yes, Karen? When you're talking about the federal funding, are you talking about the money going to the state? Because I don't trust the state. Or are you talking about just coming to the region? Well, yeah. Are you talking about I, each I, I, region no. seeking their own federal money? Yes. Yes, there are federal there are federal grants under the Second Chance Act that come out. In fact, one is due May first. It comes up every May. Now, now the five parishes they started when? About two years ago. And when are we going? When do you think? Where are you ready going? to launch? You're ready to launch in the next couple of months. Okay. Uh, you got to form the steering so team and get that organized. Form the committees, but I'm thinking you'll be in the mix uh, pretty quickly because you, you it's pretty organized. Are these five parishes in operation right now? They're doing it. No, uh, they're they're in different. Uh, uh, so we're probably yeah. Well, you state. could be. You uh, could be. And when do we have to apply for a grant? Well, we're going to see about that. I think it'll be July, August. That's why getting the steering team formed up and getting this search committee formed up is important. What do we got? Less than ten minutes, you say? Ten minutes. All right. I got to do this quick because I want you to see. This is a snapshot of the people in September of 2017 that were in prison from the Lafourche Parish. Here's the population of the parish. You had about 535 people in prison. 93% of them were male. Black-white was about evenly mixed. 42%, 43% had a high school uh, or GED. And when we look at their risk and needs, this is how that broke out. Ended up with about uh, high risk, about 22%. That's over here. Moderate risk, remember moderate's biggest, right? About 45%. And then low risk is 33%. So we should have some of these people get up and sit over there. But, but this is the way the kind of the numbers go. And then when you look at their needs level, you see the 32% of everybody across risk levels had low needs, and you had about 9% at high needs. Most folks had moderate needs. That's important to know, both on the risk level and need level. This is the first time any information like this has ever been published in the state of Louisiana. Never been done. You don't have a snapshot of who's in prison until here. This is called pipeline data. Who's in a pipeline? Now, these are the ones who are in prison. There's another picture of this that we're working on now. Let's not look at the 534 who are in prison. Let's look at the 150, or uh, let's see what the releases are, maybe a couple hundred uh, over the year. Let's look at their characteristics, the ones you're getting out. Those are the numbers we need to see. When I switch over to... Now we see about twice as many people, the same breakout of male-female, about the same breakout of race, a little bit lower on education, and these numbers aren't terribly far off from what we saw. We'll combine, we can, we'll keep these numbers up and we can combine them, but this is the first time we've seen these numbers from Terrebonne as well. This gives us a glimpse of what we're looking at. And know that, you know, if we're looking at just ballpark here, about a thousand people in prison, and I think I've got a slide here I can show you about how many people are getting out, at least from one of the parishes every year. The good news is, right, we're not working with everybody who gets out. So if this represents everybody getting out of prison and it's a thousand a year, right, 
30 some, uh, what is it, uh, about 35% are low risk, moderate risk we got about 42%, low moderate, high moderate, we're looking at somewhere around probably 40% of the people getting out, not a thousand a year, but about 400 a year. And of the 400 a year, we want to look at the ones that don't have the lowest need, but have the highest need. That helps us understand that we can wrap our hands around this in a way that we're not working with everybody. It, it, it makes it a little bit easier uh, to be able to do it. Does that make sense to everybody? Think how am I doing on time? That was three minutes. All right. I'm going to see what else I got here. This is a little foggy here, um, and I do not have uh, Lafouche in here, but I have terrible. So in uh, 2011, Terrebonne released 430 people, and within five years, 217 of them came back. <coughs> we had a 46% return rate of Terrebonne. Compare, and that's about the same across the seven parishes. It's a little bit higher than the top five parishes. It's a little bit higher than the average. Down here we see what the return rate is for all 12. 16% came back the first year. 30% came back the second year. And that goes up every year. So what we know is that we've got a recidivism rate for the whole thousand. But that's not what we want to know. It's good information. People who are low risk are coming back to prison less frequently, much less frequently. People who are on the very high end are coming back to prison much more frequently. These folks are in the middle. If I want to measure success, I want to be able to tell you that these folks didn't go to prison any more frequently because we did a little less with them. But I want to be able to tell you that if you were moderate risk or high risk, your return to prison rate went down. We have to stratify, categorize offenders according to their risk and their need level to be able to say when we look at the moderate risk group and the lower end needs and the higher end needs, we see differences when we work with them. That's how we prove the concept that's how we get the feds and the state to free up the dollars because we can show them the proof that what we're doing works. If you will sign up to help us search for and appoint the steering team, we will find the 15 or 16 individuals that will take all this stuff into heart and roll up their sleeves and begin doing this work in the next 30 to 60 days. As far as the time commitment goes, if you're a steering team member, you should expect about four hours a week on average. Extra work on top of what you're doing, or maybe it's what you're already doing, and this is just the way you're going to apply it. Steering team should meet probably to start with monthly, and eventually maybe they can work every other month. Once you form up committees, the steering team should meet every other month so that people aren't doubled up in the times of meeting. So that's a relative idea of the, uh, of the time commitment. So how do, we, how do we have people sign up for the search committee? Do we have a sign-up sheet back at the uh, table out here? So let me get a gauge from the crowd. How many folks here continue to think that this is something that you want to commit to? Let's do thumbs up. Let's do thumbs down. Look at this. Wait a minute, will you stand up a second? You just understand. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta have it straight, man. He just put his thumb up. He was one of these shaky thumbs a moment ago. Yeah. It's all about implementation. That's it is good. all about implementation. You go to the head of the class. I mean it. It is about implementation. All the research tells us that. And this is what the research tells us. And I gotta make this point. Organizational, community organizational development efforts that are led by steering teams that are informed by the research have a ten times higher likelihood of achieving their goals than those that don't in a shorter period of time. That's the science. So how many folks here are interested in signing up to be on the search committee to form up the steering team? Just give me a raise of hands. 
All right? Those of you that are raising your hands, go ahead and sign up on that sheet. we got another minute for any questions, any final comments, anything burning, anything from our law enforcement friends. We're so happy to have so many law enforcement officials. This man here smiles. He's very happy. I know why, too. <laughs> All right, thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause for this.